so at this point, the Romans are starting to conquer stuff outside of Italy. The period from the Gallic sack from around 390 to the first Punic War is the period when the Romans are sort of establishing their control over the peninsula of Italy. But, you know, it's not until the first Punic War that they start to do to get what they would think of as overseas possessions. Like up until the Gallic sack, Rome had just been another town in Italy that had some power. And they kind of think about it as being more power. They sort of think they were more powerful than they actually were back in this period. And like, oh no, we lose so much during the Gallic sack. But it's really afterwards that the Romans really start to project their power all over the peninsula of Italy. And the Samnite Wars where we had the, you know, the historically significant knee to the groin that I thought everyone would find a lot more funny than they did, um, you know, was in this period here with the Samnite Wars where they're beating up these different people up and down Italy. Um, but they're not really going anywhere where you need a boat. The first engagement they even have with people with ships is kind of with Tarentum, which is a greek city. It's called Taras in Greek on the sort of boot of Italy. And they have difficulties there. They don't really have a navy. They have to deal with the foreign invasion of Pyrrhus, who we read about a little bit. Um, the Pyrrhic invasion is kind of a big deal for the Romans. It gets them to start worrying about people outside of Italy. Like, uh-oh, you know, there are these other kingdoms around us that can come and mess with our allies and with our stuff, and we need to be worried now. In some ways, the Romans get kind of paranoid after that, where they go from just thinking about Italy to controlling all these people in Italy, bossing them around, but also worrying about who might come and, you know, kick down their little, their little Italian empire. So when you get to this period, you get the first Punic War. And this is their first war of overseas expansion, where they basically take over Sicily. And shortly after that, Corsica and Sardinia in a kind of sketchy grab that is, that does not reflect well upon the Romans. But you notice that this is an incredibly long war. Like, look at this, 264 to 241 BCE. Imagine, imagine a war going on that long. It's kind of over the top. We kind of think about the, the so-called war on terror that has been happening since 2001. People even tried to rebrand that a while back as the long war ignoring that the Long War also is a science fiction um, thing for like a, a millennia long war and other things. But, you know, it seems pretty long, kind of crazy. And we're not in, you know, active like hostilities so much, just a bunch of random sort of like enforcement police actions, targeted killings, things like that, you know, that aren't super intense. But this is a massive mobilization. For this whole period, you have huge Roman armies going out all the time and huge fleets. And it has a massive impact upon people all over Italy who would have been called up to serve in these armies. So now with this new version of Prezi, hopefully if we click here, we go to some slides. So if we wanna look at the First Punic War and the territories involved, well, Rome, here you see, the Romans control all of this. This is basically what you'd call Italy. Actually, the Romans consider this thing that we consider Northern Italy up here, Gaul, they would call this Gallia Cisalpina, Gaul this side of the Alps. And everything on the other side is Gallia Transalpina. So Gaul on this side of the Alps, Gaul on that side of the Alps. And so Rome has this nice little land empire here, and they're really good with their armies, with the dudes who march around and stab people, but they don't really have a navy. And then you have Carthage over here, your trading empire, which is, it's a little bit less in the way of like territorial occupation, but the Carthaginians being a Phoenician derived people, they really control the sea a lot more. They are trading their like establishing, you know, colonies, ports, like all sorts of things all around this area and kind of locking this down. The Carthaginians use a lot of mercenaries too. And so Carthage is here, and Carthage had been for a long time sort of fighting with a bunch of the Greeks who have also tried to colonize Sicily. You get Greek cities that are more along this area here, and you get some more Carthaginian influence things here, and then you have your poor like um, ethnic 
you know, ethnic sickles, the sort of native people sort of squished in the middle and sort of adopted into both of these groups, they've been fighting here for a really long time for control of this island. And so there's a lot of tension here between native peoples, Greeks who have colonized this whole area. Remember that Greeks have colonized around the coast of Italy too. So like Neapolis, this is Greek for new city. You have Terras here, Tarentum, a Greek city. Well, Syracuse is one of the biggest, most important Greek cities in ancient history. But because it's in Sicily, we don't think about it as Greek in the same way. But this is like, it is up there with Athens and Sparta as far as important places, Syracuse. And it's still a great place to go today. So these places, they've been fighting a long time and the Romans get drawn into this. Notice here we have the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. Just notice that they are uncomfortably close to Italy right now. You don't need to worry about that too much at the moment. So how did the Romans get pulled into this mess? Come on, click. There we go. Well, they get pulled in by a group of people called the Mamertines. The Mamertines are Italians, and it, it's actually related kind of to the word for Mars. Um, you get like weird versions in old Italian languages where he is, even in old Latin, he's sometimes not called Mars, but he's called Mawars. Um, so the Mamertines, probably a Marsy related people here. Um, these are you know, people related to the Romans in a way, or the Romans' allies, and a bunch of them end up serving as mercenaries in this city of Messana. It'll sometimes also be called Messini. Um, it's easy to get these things confused because there's also like Messenia, which is an area in the Peloponnese in Greece too, that ends up being sort of taken over by the Spartans and is their sort of slave area, and then it gets freed and they build a city, Messini, and well, anyway, that's why people kind of call this Messana. Also, don't confuse this with the Jewish fortress, Masada, which is where everyone sort of kills each other rather than submit to the Romans during the, well, one of Judea's many rebellions. Um, so anyway, the city of Masana is right at the northern tip of Sicily, and they get a bunch of these Mamertines as mercenaries because they're fighting against Syracuse. So these mercenaries and if you want and if you learn anything anything at all from this lesson never trust a mercenary never so these mercenaries think huh this is a pretty good city and they take it they they kill a lot of the men the citizens right probably take some of the women as you know their wives um and they basically take over this city. And this is a pretty horrific thing. But they're still at war with Syracuse and they kind of need some help. So they appeal to the Romans. The Romans are like, eh, no, you guys did a really bad thing. And by the way, some of our own allies and maybe some Romans too had just done a similar thing at this place called Regium, another Italian city. So Romans had been called in to help with this other city. And, you know, they happily send some troops, some of them Romans, some of them allies. And those people had similarly killed a bunch of citizens and taken over the city. And the Romans are like, no, we cannot tolerate this. And so they actually got these people and they executed them in a big public way because this violates fides. For the Romans, everything is about good faith. You need to be able to rely on the Romans. So the Romans want you to know that, well, if you oppose us, you know, we're gonna beat you down, you're gonna suffer. But if you make a deal with us, you can count on us. And so that reliability is key to foreign policy. You know, you can't, you can't expect to make any deals with any other country or anybody if they don't think that you're gonna stay by your word, right? Like, you know, basically you need to have credibility or else there's no point in even trying to negotiate, make threats, anything, it's just, why bother? No one's gonna believe you or listen to you or, or think they can rely on you. So the Romans really care about fides. And so when these people, these Mamertines come asking for help from the Romans, they're kind of like, eh, no. Except, well, except things are a little more complicated. So here's a little bit from Polybius about what the Romans are worried about. So they think, well, not unaware of this hypocrisy, but seeing that the Carthaginians had subjugated not only Libya, but 
many parts of Spain and were in control of all the islands around Sardinia and the Tyrrhenian Sea. That's the places between like Corsica and Italy, right? Um, the Romans were becoming afraid that they would be excessively dangerous and terrifying neighbors if they should take control of Sicily, having them encircled and pressing in on every part of Italy. Because of this, it was clear that they would quickly subdue Sicily with no aid coming to the Mamertines. So basically the Carthaginians are in a position of locking down this whole area. For having taken Masana, they would be about to take Syracuse in a short time and therefore rule almost all, there should be an all in here, Sicily. For seeing this and judging it necessary to not give up Masana and allow the Carthaginians to build a bridge into Italy, they debated for a long time. So if we go back to this map here, the Romans are like, well, all right, there's the city here of Masana and the Carthaginians, they control all this, they control all this, right? Well, huh, they've kind of got us hedged in here. This is, they're worried about the Carthaginians taking over and being rather a threat. And they have this idea too, well, all right, so let's say we don't help, let's say we don't help these people. Well, the Carthaginians, they had, the people of the Mamertines had actually gotten some help from Masana. i sorry, the Mamertines had gotten some help from Carthage. And so if Carthage helps them take, take out Syracuse, well, the Carthaginians are gonna go, well, you get that and you get that. It's kind of like, what, what is it? The, what's the like chip that like, you know, you have one and you can't stop? Empires are kind of like that, where if, you know, you get this place, well, then, yeah, you're pretty close to this too, so why not conquer this? And then, <coughs> excuse me, if, you, if you've taken over all Sicily, well, then you got, you got this here, you got this here. Well, you know, you, this is right here too, this whole Italy thing. And look, Regium's right there. Like, might as well go conquer this, right? You know, it makes sense. You've already taken all the, all the steps to get there. Why not keep going? Why not eat that whole, like, you know, bag of chips? Um, so the Romans are kind of worried about this. And so what they think is, well, okay, we need to protect ourselves. So let's take this over instead, in a sense. This is this idea of defensive imperialism, which lead, which is both logical and illogical at the same time. It leads to all sorts of unintended side effects. It's kind of the same thing that happens in the Cold War, where, well, let's say you're, let's say you're the Romans, right? and you wanna protect yourself against these Carthaginians. Well, maybe it's gonna make sense to make a little buffer zone in Sicily, right? Get Masana here, you know, the Carthaginians, if they wanna to come to Italy, they're gonna to have to come through Masana, so you're kind of protected. But then, wait, what if you wanna protect Masana? Well, then you need to make a further buffer zone out here. And it kind of leads you into this continual expansion where again and again and again, you have this logic of, well, I need to protect this. I need to protect myself from this you know, other person out here. So you're, you have this ever expanding frontier, which just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until, oops, I just want to defend myself, but I've conquered the whole Mediterranean. Who would have thought that would have happened? That's kind of the situation the Romans end up in. And it makes sense, but it's also like, it leads to like, you know, justifications that in a sense are kind of hypocritical, but you know, also logical, it's a problem. So the Romans debate this for a long time and they're like, well, it would be wrong to aid these Mamertines, can't do that, but wait, we're also under threat from these Carthaginians. And so the Senate is like, no, we're not gonna do this. But then as a good old Roman, as good old Roman historians like to say, well, you can blame it on the people, right? So the Romans do something bad and well, the Senate wanted to do the right thing, but then the people stepped in and they voted to do this because you, you can always blame anything bad you do on lower classes, you know? convenient scapegoat, um, they were greedy. And so they sent this dude, Appius Claudius, with a relief force. The Mamertines, they kick out the Carthaginians who had been helping them, and the, Rom and the Romans show up, and the Carthaginians are like, well, forget this, let's join with Syracuse. And so the Romans end up here in the city of Masana, and the Carthaginians join up with Hero, the guy who is in the king of Syracuse, fighting them now. So the Romans end up in this war with the Carthaginians by initially trying to help out the Mamertines against Syracuse just so that the Carthaginians didn't get too powerful. 
So this is a lot of sort of like political maneuvering to basically mean that the Romans end up pulled in kind of sketchily into de defending this little northern part of Sicily right here, this area of Masana, which, you know, it kind of makes sense if you want to protect this area here, the toe of Italy, well, then you kind of want to control this too, maybe. Um, and if, you know, people you don't trust are going to end up in there, you want to keep them out. But that leads them into war with Syracuse, this city here which is, like I said, one of the biggest, most important cities of all in Greece. Super wealthy, super powerful. And here's like, just like a little idea of what it might've looked like back in the day. It's built on, you got this mainland bit, but you also have this cool little island of Ortigia, which is really cool. If you ever get the chance to go to Sicily, it is amazing. This is a great city, lots of fun. There was a tiny little public aquarium around here and they had like a giant clown trigger fish. Um, it was massive, probably not around anymore, but I wonder. Um, anyway, I highly recommend going here. There's also the Arethusa Fountain. Greeks thought that this, for some reason, that this river, um, the Achelous River, I think, um, yeah, I think it was the Achelous, um, in Greece sort of submerged under the Mediterranean and popped back up in a fountain here. That totally makes sense. But anyway, there's a lot of cool stuff about um, Syracuse that I could talk about for, far too long. But anyway, it's big city here. The Romans end up fighting against the Syracusans and the Carthaginians. And after the Romans get their initial land victory, well, Hero is like, well, shoot, I can't fight these Romans. And he becomes their ally instead. And he sort of helps them out with a lot of their supply issues. So the Romans go super quickly from fighting just Masana, or Masana here to also being on the side of Syracuse. So you have Masana and Syracuse. You have this sort of like eastern coast of Sicily, and then they're fighting these Carthaginians who have a lot of control over this area. So the Romans very quickly end up going from protecting this one little city to fighting a territorial war over this whole massive island, which is eventually going to become their first so-called province. So eventually they need some boats for this because they go back and forth. Actually, they fight a lot about the city Acragas which is also called Agrigentum. And so they make some land inroads here, but no matter how much they conquer on land, the Carthaginians has, have this fleet where they can sail around and beat up all these cities on the coast. And so they can't really hold stuff. They decide they need to build some ships. The Romans don't know how to deal with ships, but luckily a Carthaginian ship runs aground and they reverse engineer it. And this is one of the coolest things in this whole historical development here because, well, reverse engineering a ship, you know, people weren't really sure what this meant for a while until they found this thinger, which is, it's called the Marsala ship, um, which is, well, Marsala is basically here. Um, right now, it is the modern name, but it's the ancient city of Lilibium, which is also an important place that ends up besieged later in the war. And this ship, it got sunk, but a little bit of it got buried in the sand. And because it was like an anaerobic environment without oxygen, the wood gets preserved. It doesn't rot. And so the keel of the ship has been found and a lot of the actual planks. And you, if you go and see this in the museum, you can get kind of close to it. And it's really cool because these aren't just random bits of wood, but in the Carthaginian script, there are little symbols on all of these little pieces here that show that this wasn't just like, okay, you know, you just sort of like make random, random parts to fit until you end up with a ship and you just sort of wing it, which is what people sometimes thought. People used to think sometimes, well, you know, how do you build an ancient ship? How much are they, are they all exactly the same? Or do you just like find a big old tree, make that your keel and, you know, then just fit whatever you need on to, you know, make a ship and everyone's gonna look a little bit different because it's just kind of organic. You got different bits of wood, who knows? Instead, what people found from this with all these little markings is that every piece is built to fit. It's kind of like a model kit or any of those sort of things where every single piece has a very specific size and length. And it's very clear that it all goes together in a very specific way so that while you don't have a factory, these things are kind of like mass produced in that they have a plan and every ship is gonna end up pretty much exactly the same. It's really neat. 
Now this ship is pretty tiny on the whole. Here's like a reconstructed picture of it from the museum book. Um, so hypothetica means hypothetical in Italian. Um, and so this is what this thing might look like. You can see that, I mean, it's not a small boat, but it, this is not a big old warship. Um, it's what you might call like, some people will call it like a Liburnian or something. Um, it's a it's a little light warship. It's nothing super big, nothing that you would use for like trying to sink a bunch of other big ships. But it shows you a lot of how these things were made. And it is super cool. Now, ancient warships are incredibly awesome because, oh, come on, click, click, click. Here you go. So because they work by ramming. And so this is a modern reconstruction of an ancient Greek trireme. This is a smaller thing than the ones that would have been used, the main warships in this war. But this is from the sort of trireme that would have been used in like the 400s and 500s um, BCE by the ancient Greek city-states. So they reconstruct what this might have looked like. And there was a whole big deal about testing it, see if people understood how it worked. And they were able to get this up to pretty close the speed of what we think ancient ships did. So it seems like we understand how it worked pretty well. And this ship was made in Greece. You know, it's all crewed by all these people. It's a really fun thing to look up later. Um, you can see that it's got this ram. And how these ships work is, well, you might have some archers on top, but some of these ships don't even have much of a deck. You might not have a ton of soldiers. You mainly work by maneuvering and trying to use this little metal thing here, this little beak of the ship, to poke a hole in another ship and sink it. Or, you know, you can pull up your oars and if you can sort of like slide alongside, if you snap off all the oars and like ram into them, you can also do a lot of damage that way. So there's a lot of skill in doing this. And it takes a lot of training to train a Navy too. All these people, if one person gets their oar slightly out of, out of sync with them, the forces are such that it can cause a sort of resonance sort of thing happening where the oar, it goes in slightly different. The force of the whole ship moving forward actually causes one oar to snap, which can sometimes cause a chain reaction. And one or two people getting out of time in their rowing can actually be kind of catastrophic. It takes a lot of practice to do this. It's not just as simple as like get in a boat and go. And so the Romans, while they're building all these ships for the first time, they don't know how to make these warships, they actually line up all of them like on the shore and they put them all on benches and they just sit there practicing rowing on the shore while sitting as their boats are being built, hope, hoping to get ready for this. They are not skilled, you know, skilled Navy people here, but they do their best and they sort of like, it's kind of like the ancient equivalent of a moonshot, right? Like the Apollo program, except for like, let's build a Navy. And initially it's their ships, you know, they're not as good, they're not as fast. Naval tactics are also really tough. Well, when the Romans initially do this, well, they start trying to just fight a normal naval battle, but their, their commander, uh, one of the many Gnaeus Scipios, um, he actually gets a little bit ahead of some of his ships and he gets captured and he gets the name, he becomes Gnaeus Scipio Asina, which is exactly what it sounds like ass, um, Naya Scipio the ass, and not just any ass, a feminine ass. Um, he gets this nickname from this. He, it seems like he actually eventually got like ransomed and came back and was put in charge of another army because, um, yeah, um, aristocratic privilege here. But, you know, he gets captured and this other dude, Gaius Duilius, ends up kind of stuck with this fleet, not sure what to do. He's like, I don't think we can beat these guys with standard warfare. And so, he comes up with this thing called the corvus, the raven or the crow, however people want to translate that bird. And they're like, well, we're really good at this whole like land army thing. So what if we can turn a naval battle into a land battle? So they build this giant plank and it swings around. And as the Carthaginian ships are trying to do like clever maneuvers, come in and ram them, you just stab this thing down in, the spike sort of gets it stuck. And then a bunch of soldiers run over and kill everybody. And in that way, the Romans are able to actually beat the Carthaginians who are trying to do a normal old naval battle. It's kind of like, you know, that Indiana Jones thing where like the guys like got a sword and, you know, then Indiana Jones just like shoots him. 
And it's a similar sort of deal where the Romans turn a naval battle into a land battle and are able to defeat the Carthaginians. So this is just a fun little picture of what this might look like. You know, you can swing it around a little bit. Though it does have the, oh, we have a really weird perspective issue with this drawing. Let's, oh, wait, no, that's the sale. Never mind. Um, anyway, they eventually do pretty well with this. And this leads to the Battle of Cape Echnomus later on in 256. And this is where the Romans go down to invade Carthage. And this is where our reading was picking up because we have this dude, Marcus Atilius Regulus. He is one of the two consuls here who lead this massive formation, um, this massive sort of invasion. And there's a really cool battle, which is probably the biggest battle in history until World War II in terms of naval numbers. The figures kind of differ here and there. Um, and I'm going to post a little video where someone basically walks through this. Um, he basically narrates it with like footage from Rome Total War. To sorry, Rome Total War II. And he basically just narrates the version that you get in Polybius's account of this. But it's a really cool, interesting battle where you see a lot of how naval tactics change and how the Romans' use of this corvus really changes the thing because the Carthaginians are far better sailors, but the Romans are just really, in a sense, kind of tanky with these you know, ships full of soldiers based on turning this into a land battle. And they managed to actually defeat the Carthaginians pretty spectacularly. And that clears the way for Regulus to invade Africa. And I could talk about this for a long time, but we are about where we need to be at for right now. I'm going to also post another continuation of the reading today. And that is kind of where I wanted to end. Hopefully this was a little bit more entertaining perhaps than the Caudine Forks, but ooh, we got some geometry happening too. Um, but yeah, do you have any questions about any of this? Is there, did this make sense of how the Romans end up fighting in, in Sicily and how these ships work and all that? I guess I do make some strange faces. I hear talking, or I mean, I see talking, Brennan, but I don't hear anything. <laughs>